Okay. How many of you have used Scikit-learn? Raise your hands. Cool. So you all recognize this API. You could fit things. You could predict things. It's marvelous. All right. So Scikit-learn solves the supervised learning problem where you're given data x and targets y, and you want to figure out what f is. Right. And in Scikit-learn, I'm going to use these terminologies a lot. So I'm going to put it out here now. Um, x is usually a rectangular data set where you have um, samples as rows and features as columns. And um, y um, is usually n samples. And if it's regression, it's floats. If it's classification, it's integers. Okay? Now, we're here to talk about histogram gradient boosting, right? Okay, oh, <laughs> boosting. So, what is boosting? Which is, boosting is a very generic machine learning term. It's where you, you want, remember, you want to approximate the f, value, f function, and it's a summation of many different pieces of functions. So that's just boosting in general. There's many ways to boost. There's added boosting. But today, we're talking about gradient boosting. Um, gradient boosting is a special type of boosting. And if, if, you, if you think about gradients and you're familiar with neural networks, you need like a loss function, right? So we have loss functions. And for regression, we have least squared loss. And um, for in our newest version, 0.22, it's going to be released today, not today, this month, <laughs> there's um, least absolute deviation, deviation. And for classification, there's cross entropy loss. Um, as an example, to make this kind of more, con more concrete, um, let's focus on the least squared loss for this talk. And for my example, least squared is just, um, um, it's, it's a, it's, you could define a loss. Um, y is you know why during training, f is the function you're trying to learn, and x is your data, and this is the least squared loss. Um, you, you take the difference and you square. Um, you could also, now that you have a loss function and it's gradient boosting, you could take the gradient of this. Note that the loss is a scalar value. This gradient is now a vector value. y is a vector, f x is a prediction of vectors, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be, the length is gonna be as the number of samples you have in your training set. You could also take the Hessian, but in this case, it's very simple since it's, it's one. You learn this all in like elementary school calculus, right? So, great. Um, it's also a vector, so, and it's a vector, so it's, you know, it's one, full ones, right? Not scalar, these are two vectors. Poof, all right, so, boosting. Remember, boosting is we want to learn these series of functions. Um, in our histogram gradient boosting, we start with initial condition. Um, we start with a constant. We're going to give like the most easiest prediction in the beginning. Um, usually it's the mean for um, v square. Um, for um, cross entropy, it's uh, log odds ratio. And we're going to go through with the mean. So it's going to be a constant in the beginning. And then that recursion condition looks very much like um, gradient descent. But this is gradient descent. This is, it's almost exactly like gradient descent. But the gradient is respect to the function. So it's taking a derivative respect to a function. Whew, there's a lot of math. Like, it's mathy. <laughs> Um, and the learning rate is, there's a learning rate just like in normal gradient descent. Um, to make this kind of more concrete, um, we, remember we had the gradient from the v squared, we could plug it back in, and then we could define our function h of m to be that little portion on the, on the left-hand side. Great. Okay. Um, if you squint really hard, you can see that h of m is the negative gradient. Right? If you squint, it's just the negative of it. And now, now this comes a recursive relationship. You start off with a constant, and then you're going to add on to this constant, this, these, these, these functions, h of m's, and then it slowly gets to your prediction. So now the goal is, what is h of m? How do we get to this h of m? Like, it's, it's, like, is it magic? Mm, maybe. <laughs> um, let's do another example, just to kind of concretify this um, with like, numbers. <laughs> so let's say, um, in this example, um, x is your age, let's say, and Y is your income in thousands of dollars, all right? Pretty simple. You have one feature in this case. Um, H, F of zero is the mean. It's a constant. So you can start off with the mean. So in this case, the mean of Y is 78. So that's my initial prediction. Um, remember, there's a term called, there's a Y minus H of F of zero. We could calculate that. That's the difference between your predicted value and the actual value. You, that's on row, column four. And H of zero is the thing you want to learn. Right? It's not going to be exact. You see, this, this h of 0 is trying to predict the y minus f of 0. And it's going to be, you know, it's, 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 it's going to do its best. And, um, 
you could, and this is the first prediction. This is the first learner I, this is the first predictor I learned. Um, we could do this in over again, right? We could, remember the function was, the expression was recursive. So you could add, uh, so I moved f of zero here and f, h of zero here, and you could add f of zero and h of zero to get the next prediction. So in this case, the dirt column. Um, and then you could take the difference again, and you, you get the difference, and now the difference is now smaller, and then you do this recursively. You do it h of two, and then you just keep on going. Right? This is the boosting process. Right? <laughs> um, so now, so this is for training. For training, you have these y values, so you could take the difference. But during, predic during prediction, what you, what you learn during the training process is, are these h of h0, h, h0, h1, in this case, since I boosted it twice. Um, in prediction, you, um, you plug in your, let's say that I want to do, I want to know the income at age 40. You could plug in this 40 into these functions that you created, and then you get the prediction during prediction time. So you're learning these functions, h. The thing is, how do we learn these h's? Um, uh, this is trees. We use trees to do that. So h of m are predictions, and they're trees. Not necessarily Christmas trees, but trees. <laughs> OK. Um, so now we need to know how to grow these trees. Um, to grow these trees, we need to we need to we have to first for every node we need to find out for every node that we want to split, we have to look at each feature and we have to sort the feature and then find the best split point. And then we have to do this for every leaf node, and then after that we could, we could split on the best um, node. The thing is, how do we evaluate the split, right? If you do random forests, it's like there's an impurity loss. Like, like, but in this case, since we have a loss function we want to, we want to optimize, we could, um, remember this, we have a loss function, we have these gradients, we have these Hessians, um, uh, and we want to grow these trees in such a way that it minimizes this loss function, right? Because this is the ultimate goal of this problem. Um, we, um, this is, I'm going to hand wave math here. Um, so you could, and generically, you could write a loss function as a Taylor expansion of two to the second degree. So you have the gradient of the Hessians, and then you could assume a tree structure so that every sample goes to a leaf, and then you do fancy math and you get this, this gain, right? <laughs> um, which is, um, you, so in this case, this is how you evaluate a split, okay? Um, the G of L and H of L are sums of gradients. Remember, these, these gradients before were vectors, so each sample has their own gradient. And you could sum them. And since um, the samples end up in nodes, you could sum all the, the samples on the left-hand node and sum everything on the right-hand node. And you just, for every split, you could evaluate, you could evaluate the splits this way. Um, I left out the regularization um, in scikit-learn. The regulation is set to zero by default. You could, you could set it, and I didn't include an expression, but it's there. So now we have this thing, right? We, now we know how to do evaluate split. You just use that gain thing we just saw. Um, are we done? Um, no, because sorting the feature, it's n log n, because um, where n is the samples. And um, splitting, finding a split point, if it's continuous values, there's and now it's split points, because if you, if you have a um, real value data, you could have many different split points. So this is pretty slow. So this is where we come to the, the his part of grading boosting. Um, the his part of grading boosting. So in his grading boosting, we have to build these histograms. But the first thing we do to build these histograms is to bin our data. And I thought really hard about this visualization. Um, <laughs> where um, y is the feature and x is the row index. So normally your data looks like this. It's just scattered, it's not ordered, right? Um, in this case, I'm binning with 10 bins. And what binning does is it discretizes your feature space. Um, so everything on the, t on the, all the data on the top, bottom 10% is now one number, in this case zero. The next 10% becomes one, and the next 10% becomes two, and so forth and so on. So it discretizes your feature space. So if you look at this in, if you look at this with the values, um, let's say this is our original data, it goes from floats to ints. Okay, so discretizing, binning, magic. Uh, okay, so now that we binned our data, and remember each sample has their own corresponding gradients, 
Um, you could now build these histograms of gradients and Hessians. Um, in this case, I my bin I binned with five, and um, so for a given node, there's going to be samples in it, and each sample will be in a bin, <laughs> and um, you can sum up the gradients of every sample in a given bin, and then build these histograms where the y-axis is the sum of the gradients. Okay, uh, so. Now that we have these things, for, for a given node, we have these histograms. We can now build these, because building histograms means scanning through all your samples and then just summing things up. And um, now the split points are finite because now the split points of, are just the thresholds between your bins. You have, you're building, you don't have to sort your features anymore because everything in the first bin is less than everything in the second bin. Everything in the second bin is, more, is less than the feature. So it's ordered by default. And um, you have finite amount of split points. You have n-bin split points in this case, O of n -bin split points. And so this makes it much faster. So this, lastly, for histograms, um, normally when we end up at a node, we already have the histogram for that node. So, this, so I had this thing on the left, which is uh, what we had before, where we sum up the gradients. But normally we have what's on the right, which is we have already have the gradients and Hessians for the parent node. So uh, if you want to know the gradients and Hessians, the histograms for the left and right, we only need to calculate for the one of them and then take the, the difference to get the other one. So you see there's a nice little relationship here between the parents and the children. So that's like the crash course on <laughs> how to build this stuff. <laughs> like this is the feel of the algorithm. Um, remember why are we building these trees? Like the whole point of doing all this magic was to, um, all this math, like magic and math is, um, doing all this math was to find these HFMs so that we sum them up to approximate this F, right? That's the whole goal of this matter. Um, so now if we step back a little and go through what it feels like to be data going through this algorithm um, in chronological order. Um, first, in the algorithm, we bin the data, as we saw before. Then we make an initial prediction, which is a constant. And then, since we have our predictions, now we can get the gradients and Hessians. And then we go to the boosting process, okay? So this is the algorithm, like, like 10 feet above. Like, not, 10 feet is not that high, but yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is the algorithm. So now, let's talk about the implementation. So how do we implement this in scikit-learn? Pure Python, well, that's gonna be awfully slow because most of this is procedural code. Like, if you think about implement what I just described, it's very procedural. Um, we could do it in NumPy, but we do do it in NumPy. You do use NumPy, but most of the speed ups in NumPy comes from doing vectorized operations or using BLAST and um, using linear algebra. But as you can see, there's there's barely any linear algebra here. I'm just um, summing up things and trying to do things very procedurally. So we do write it in Cython. And if we use pure Cython, it would, this would be okay. It would run serially. And it would be okay, but it won't be as quick as our competitors like um, LightGBM and XGBoost and uh, LightGBM and XGBoost. And so we take advantage of OpenMP, which allows us to parallelize our code, okay? Um, so how do we take advantage of OpenMP? It's, who, use, who writes Cython? Like, kind of. Cool. <laughs> this is going to apply to you guys, right? <laughs> Cython is a way to write Python. It's, it, it's very similar to Python, but you can compile it, and it runs much faster. That's the gist of Cython. So I'm going to show you parts of the code where we take advantage of OpenMP and um, see what it looks like, all right? So, so ma there's many ways to parallelize our code. You could parallelize it. This, I'm just gonna show you. So binning our data. W once we bin our data, we have to map <coughs> from the view values to the integer values, and that's a binary search. If I didn't do it in, P uh, if I do it in Cython, it looks like this. You just have a normal range. If you do it in Python, it also looks like this. So Cython and Python is really nice, yeah? Um, <laughs> technically, all these are memory views, but yeah. anyways. <laughs> so you can use range, and this works. This is serial. But what you do to use OpenMP and, and you set up a compiler to compile this with OpenMP is you change the range into a P range and, and then you release the GIL. And bam, magic, it works. Right? So this is, um, this is taking advantage of all your cores and it's 
it makes it go faster. You're doing byte, yeah. So that's the bidding of the data. Building histograms is the same way. Um, in this case, I'm releasing the Go another way with a context manager. And um, this is the sheet, this is, um, since building the histograms are independent, it's building histogram for one feature is independent for building histogram for another feature, you could parallelize this as well. So you could build the feature, the histograms for each feature independently, and so you could distribute the work. Okay, so this is, it's, so if you want to do this in, in, with OpenMP, you just use PRange and it, it works. You do, it for this, you do the same for the subtraction thing we just saw. So, so yeah, so you could, you could distribute the work. If you, find, if you want to find the best splits, and after you find it, if you want to find the best splits, to find the best splits, is, you could also parallelize it through the features and you use PRange. If you are splitting, this one's a little more interesting, this is splitting with n threads. So you're, you're, manually, you're manually separating the work um, between, to each thread in this case. So you could, there's a lot of tricks you could do for OpenMP. Um, one thing to note is that for, in this case, I'm updating Hessians. Um, I'm, this is just writing memory in parallel. Right? This is, I'm, not doing much, this is, I'm not doing much work. I'm just parallelizing the writing to memory. And that also makes it faster. So it's very nice, very useful right? if you want to make Cython things faster. All right, so, whew. okay, so it's, I recommend if you write Cython that it's, if you want to speed, speed up your code, if, you, if Cython, since Cython runs serially and you want to make your code run in parallel, it's very nice to use um, OpenMP. It's really cool. It's very simple to use. I saw all my ranges just become P ranges. So have at it, I guess. <laughs> um, next, so that's OpenMP. So let's step back again to like um, the history and grading boosting. This is kind of more applied. Um, so there's, there's a lot of hyperparameters in our history and grading boosting. I'm gonna go through all of them. <laughs> and it's not that many, it's not, it's, not, it's not crazy, right? It's not like millions, it's like 10 or something. And not 10, 20. <laughs> so let's, um, there's easy to conceptualize because you know the algorithm, like you, you kind of know the algorithm. So the binning of the data, we have something called max bins, it's the number of bins, all right? That's it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the initial positions, the gradients, and the Hessians, you, you need a loss function, right? How do we define a loss function? There's, um, for regression, we have two, like I said before. For classifier, we have something called auto, which decides for you if you have a binary, if it decides for you from your training set. If your training set is binary, you use binary cross entropy. If it's multi-class, you use categorical cross entropy. And there's a regulation, so that's, that was hyperparameters. Now the, the more interesting ones are the boosting ones. <laughs> uh, the boosting ones, where the boosting, you remember it's, how, um, the boosting is how many estimate, how many trees you wanna grow in this case. So we have the learning rate, as we described before. We have max iter, which is the number of trees you wanna grow. Um, let's, look at, let's look at the graphs of this. Um, in this one, do you wanna take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So if you look, um, if you look at the, a graph of this, um, on the x-axis is max iter, is how many trees you have, and the uh, y-axis is R2 score, it's, which is the metric. Um, you, look at, you see that the training score increases monotonically, while the test score flattens out, which is kind of what you expect. If you, at some point, you add more trees, it does nothing to your test set, okay? Now, remember there's another, there's another hyperparameter called the learning rate. By default, it's 0 0.1. Um, let's say I just go crazy, I make it 0 0.5. You, um, the dotted line is what we had before. All my, all my examples, the dotted line is just this, this one, all right? So I'm comparing it to this original one. So now the solid line is the new, the, the new score as it evolves with the number of trees you add. In this case, the, I set the learning rate 0 0.5, that means that you see it shoots up, it, over, it overfits, and now the test score goes down, so now it's overfitting. So the, the learning rate, the higher the learning rate, the more your model will overfit, okay? Whew, okay, growing the trees, <coughs> growing the trees, there's, um, there's hyperparameters to grow the trees, there's these, the max leaf nodes is how many leaf nodes you have in, your, in a given tree. Max depth is set to none, which means grow as much as possible given these two other conditions. 
and um, min samples leaves is how many samples end up in a given leaf. So in this case, these are the defaults. 20 means um, for a given leaf, only 20 gets into that leaf. Um, max, okay, so let's, make, let's look at some graphs again. <laughs> um, this is max leaf nodes. Um, as you see, um, by default is um, 31. Oh, this is 31. <laughs> 31, and if you set it to 200, um, you see that it will overfit your data. It will overfit your data, and um, yeah, it overfits. Boom. Now I have, I have lots of things that overfit. If I set max depth to like something like three, this is the case where it underfits because all your trees are now short and stubby, and um, they will underfit. You see all the graphs move down. I skip. I skipped this. Um, um, in the training process, we also have um, early stopping. So there's a condition we could, you can set up so that it early stops, as in it's in the beginning, it's, it splits up the data so that it has a, val a separate validation set. And while it goes to trees, it checks this validation set to see if, there's a, if the early stopping condition holds. So I'm going to tell you the parameters that um, control this early stopping procedure. So there's a scoring. Um, there's a validation fraction, which is how much of your data set you, you want to leave out for um, early stopping. There's n iter no change. It's set to none, which means no early stopping. You have to set it to a number to make early stop. And there's a tolerance, which is how, if, when it compares um, your score to the, to the best score seen so far, this is the, the tolerance it has. <laughs> um, so let's look at what it looks like to early stop. Let's say um, the dotted line is what we had before. If it doesn't already stop, it just continues on. And as you expect, if I set um, n iter no change to 10, it already stops when 10, after 10 rounds of adding trees, um, if the score doesn't get better, it just stops, all right? Whew. All right, I have 25 more minutes, that's good. Okay, so there's miscellaneous ones. There's like verbose mode, which I'll show you soon because that's the, the terminal you saw before. Um, there's random state to control the random state. And there's also an environmental variable that controls the number of cores your algorithm uses. Okay, and it's, um, it's o OMP num threads, all right? So I'm, in this case, I did set it to 12. So I'm gonna showcase what this looks like with, I'm gonna show you some benchmarks for, for the Higgs boson data set, um, which has 88 million records and 28 features. It's a binary classification problem. And um, one means there's a signal, which means there's a Higgs boson. Zero means it's background. Um, so, and I'm gonna compare it to the other libraries. Um, in this case, I said, a benchmark is really hard in this case because everyone has, everyone has um, different ways to grow trees. And um, what's constant among, among them is that they do boosting. So they, have, they add trees and they have a learning rate. Right? So they, they all do the boosting process. So in this case, I set the max iter to 100, learning rate to 0 0.1, and I use all 12 cores. And then you have, um, you can see that the first three are, um, SK Learn and LightGBM are equivalent in time to train and have similar accuracy and ROC, okay? Um, so let's say I set max iter to like 500, let's say, um, to some longer time. Um, you can see that SQLearn and like GBM are amongst the same. Um, and um, the ROC scores that got better, like, because you have more trees, like, it got better. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the cool thing is that scikit-learn is written in Cython, and um, like GBM is written, and Akibus is in C++, and it's pretty cool that we get this performance just from writing Cython, okay? Um, most of you don't have 12 core machines, so I ran this on my laptop as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I ran on my laptop, um, I got 85 seconds um, for um, 100 rounds and I got 85 seconds, and same for like GBM, 88, 86, and a Cubus is 115, so it works, it's magic. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna show you a demo of um, the verbose mode and see how it takes advantage of your cores. This is awesome. So I set X, all right, so I set it to 12. This is a 12 core machine. I SSH into it, right? And it's, and I have the script that runs the benchmark. In this case, I'm making 50 trees in this case. And so this is, this would hopefully run. All right, cool. It, first it bins the data and then it shows you um, how long each tree is taken. On the right-hand side, you can see that it's using 
12 cores. Um, it, it has 12 cores and have, it has hyperthreads, but OpenMP is, is really bad with hyperthreads, so you should set it to the number of actual cores you have. Um, and then, bam, like, it's, this, is, this went through 8.8 .8 million records, and, like, and it did it in 20 seconds in this case because I used 50, and it's, it's cool. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, demo. Like, this isn't fair. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, demo, right. Shoot, all right. Um, roadmap. Um, this was on a roadmap, but it has been added, missing values. It's coming in um, 0 0.22. If your data has missing values and you call fit and predict, it works. So this is the, uh, this is the first estimator we have in Scikit-learn that natively supports missing values, and it's it's nice. <laughs> All right. What we have on the after 0 0.22, our feature roadmap is categorical features that are, or discrete, which would speed up training, um, sparse data support, uh, which is uh, sparse data support, <laughs> and um, sample weights, which, which there, there's a PR in sample weights, and adding sample weights to this would be nice. Um, now, um, that, that's the conclusion. Um, please use it. This is how you use it. Enable gradient boosting, and it's an experimental feature, so you have to have this import first. If you want to try out the dev build, which is the one, that, this is, is this is the build that supports missing values. That's how you install it. And um, all these slides and all the my benchmark script is in this repo. And get it. Okay. gradient boosting. It's wonderful. <laughs> and that's it. That's my talk. <laughs> Questions? Um, yeah. Do you support the quantile last function? No, but we could. I don't see why not. We don't. We don't support that, right? No, no, no. Why do you use uh, OpenMP here, but you use Java mostly in the rest of Scikit-Learn? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, job. There's different ways to parallelize in OpenMP. Um, in this case, the procedural code is. Ingrained in the algorithm, open joblib wants to, to multiprocess in joblib. You have you you it, it works in a way where you your Python processes are on different cores. In this case, the algorithm is also is actually running different cores, so it's different. Uh, Alex, there's a question there. Um, yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, so this uses binning. Yeah, you know, there used to be just like a gradient boosting classifier, which I think is different than regressor. Um, I'm wondering what's the trade-off in, in terms of like model performance when you use the binning and versus not using the binning, and how do you decide like what binning strategies to use? Um, in this, in the traditional gradient boosting in Scikit-Learn, we don't bin. We do what we had before. We we do the sorting bit. And um, it doesn't, binning actually makes everything better because it's, it, like, there's no reason not to bin in my, and there's no reason to make the bin size smaller. <laughs> you can control it if you want. Oh, there is a reason. You could, it's, it's faster than training, but keeping the bin size in as 255 in this case, it's the best, and it's much better than grade, the, our traditional gradient boosting estimator. <laughs> it's, it's not much of a trade off, it's good in general. <laughs> Um, I think I, I want to go back and forth. Yeah. Have you tried uh, using Numbo to run this on GPU? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, not on GPU. I think you asked this question in SciPy. Um, <laughs> um, there's a there's a, um, an, another package that uses Numbo, and while we're developing this, and we have not considered putting it on GPU. But like to. If if Numbo becomes a dependency of Scikit-Learn or or SciPy. Then yeah, but if like we don't adding new dependencies is something we try to resist. So, and yeah, maybe just experiment. Yeah, we will experiment though. I think maybe, <laughs> hopefully. Um, the side. Oh yeah. Yeah. How do you guys handle uh, missing values? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that one's. Um, we save a bin for missing values, and we scan left to right, <laughs> and it's it's, it's kind of in depth. So I guess um, Nick knows all about it, and he's two seats away. 
<laughs> if you want to talk to me about it. <laughs> but uh, next, and, uh, uh, we can talk after, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. basically, you just treat basic values as a single bound, yeah. and you just do the algorithm as normal. Like, missing values are in one bin, and you treat it as okay. So you save a bin for missing values. Right, that, that's why our bin size is 255. It's not 256. We store everything as uint8, which you think is 256, but we save one of the bins for missing. Right, that's the magic. <laughs> right, like, yeah, I'd love to talk later for, about it. Um, yeah? Why is regularization zero? Is it zero all the time? Oh, it's, it's zero. Why is it zero? I, I, it was, it was, it's zero in the code. <laughs> it's zero. Um, we do have a min Hessian in, in the algorithm that caps the bottom, so it works with min. <laughs> I think it just works, and I, it's it's in the code. And I think I don't. I, do you know the answer to that? Well, what? Why is the re we put the regulation equal to zero? Uh, because like you being this so. <laughs> we like you being does it. Okay. <laughs> Sure, we, we, oh, because um, the algorithm is inspired by LightGBM, and we, um, Nicholas spent a lot of time going through the C++ code and figuring out how to cytonize it, and it turns out they set L2 regularization to zero. So. Uh, is that depending on the model? Because this was the um, L2 distance and that one, Oh, no, oh, no, no. It's the, oh, oh, so it's L2, it's, it's the, the, the regulation is on the, Square scores of your, some of the square scores of your trees. So it's not on, it's, it's not depending on the loss function. It's, it's the regulation is on the, the scores itself on the on the on the leaves. It's it's yeah. So it's it's, it's independent of your 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 loss function. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's it's not related to the gradient part, but it's related to the tree part. So it's it's related to um, it's related to the tree part. Yes. Yeah, okay. you have the same trees. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right. That's it? All right. We're good? Questions? All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>